your brother, your friend, your dietitian, back again for another installment in spirit, nutrition, books that changed my life, my bondage, and my freedom by Frederick Douglass. Let's get it popping. My bondage and my freedom. Why is this such a pivotal, phenomenal work? Well, for me, um, I originally read a smaller um, ver version of, like a child's version of Frederick Douglass' biography when I was a child, uh, uh, autobiography when I was a child, and it didn't really do his story justice at all. As a young man, I think in 2013, I, so I was like 23, I read, I picked up and read My Bondage and My Freedom by Frederick Douglass. What makes this book so phenomenal, and I'm just kind of really getting chills almost thinking about it, is that it's beyond the Horatio Agger, you know, rack to riches story. It's more phenomenal than racks to riches. It's, it's, it's more phenomenal than Abraham Lincoln coming from nothing to something. It's so phenomenal, it's, it's flabbergasting. It's almost unbelievable because what you have is a man who went from slavery to the penultimate level of society. Like he didn't go from slavery to freedom and just starting a, a, just a, a family and having a, a small blacksmith shop or, or something like that. This man went from not knowing his father or possibly having his master be his father, uh, being a bastard of his, of his father, of his master, um, and not knowing his birthday, not knowing anything about his history, and being a slave, chattel, less than, considered less than human, no rights, ignorant, living in darkness, to being an advisor to Abraham Lincoln, to being a, um, a foreign, you know, dealing in foreign affairs. He was the appointee dealing with Haiti and uh, Republica Dominicana or Dominican Republic. He became a famous orator, um, an author. He had a, a journal, you know, that he that he, a national and international journal. He was uh, abolitionist, um, a women's suffragist. He became phenomenal. Lived an, ex an extensive life, a long life. Had many children, two wives, and he had a large mansion estate that still exists now in Anacostia, um, in Washington D.C. One of my goals is actually to go and see it. But let me get back to why this book changed my life. This book changed my life because it dropped something heavy on me. I had read about slavery, the horrors of slavery. Um, but what Frederick Douglass does with his autobiography, first I want to say he wrote three autobiographies. Um, I've read one and a half of his autobiographies because he, or did he write two or three? I think he wrote three. But he wrote them at different stages in his life. He wrote one when he was like 38 or 48 or something. Then he wrote one when he was like 64. Then he wrote one when he was almost about to pass away, when he was like in his 70s, almost 80. Um, and each one progresses, but they each one includes the beginning um, stages or the, the first part of it. And I think I read the second one. I think this is the second one that he wrote. And so um, I started reading the last one, but um, I didn't finish it. But... What he does in the book is he details slavery because he was there firsthand in language that's so vivid because of how educated he, he how he became after he freed himself from slavery. It's it's almost horrific. It's horrifically splendid. It's splendid because you get a firsthand description of slavery. So you so it's a it's almost it's almost in a way a primary document. It's almost like a journal. I mean, it's his memoir, it's his autobiography. A journal of slavery, of what happened. And it's not from a slave who can't speak eloquently or who can't write. So you may get a less detailed experience. 
this guy, Frederick Douglass, is breaking it down to the T. He's explaining the, the flower beds in the in the uh, in the manner of the, man, of the of the of the master of the mansion, the river and the and the strawberries and everything that was growing. Whereas he lived in a hut, he got one outfit a, a, a day a, a year, and it was it was ra it was rags. He explains seeing a woman hung up and beaten, half naked, beaten, while she was yelling out and crying, and the master getting off from it. He explains, you know, the horror of being worked to the point where he his mind was numb, to the point where he was broken. It's another thing talk, that's spoken about in history um, is the breaking of slaves, how if a slave was rowdy or rebellious, they would take the slave and they would break the slave, take the slave to another plantation, take the slave off um, to a different location and they would beat the slave, work the slave, sexually assault the slave, do things to break the slave spirit. He details that. He details how cunning and conniving the, the, the guy was who, who broke him. And he talks about the point of being broken. He talks about the point of resurrecting. He talks about how he dreamed of his freedom. And this kind of stuff, this kind of detail is like, this is priceless. It's priceless. A, a, a explanation like this because a lot of times, this is, this is something that bothers me. I talked to my brother, my brother about it. And, it. and life is relative. It's all relative. But a lot of people complain of privilege and the fact that they don't have privilege and they're living in America. And it makes me want to cry sometimes because you have Frederick Douglass who had to fight his way onto trains even in the North when he was free fighting against segregation, had to fight his, ma his, his master during the time of slavery, had to fight to learn how to read, had to do all these things, and he still came into greatness, still owned you know, a 12-bedroom you know, mansion. He still uh, was internationally known, government-appointed government official. And then you have people that have internet, the right to vote, all these things stacked in their favor, living in America, one of the greatest nations most privileged nations on the planet and they're talking about white privilege versus black privilege but then you have Frederick Douglass who shows us that it's not about privilege necessarily it's necessarily it's about what's inside of you so one other thing that's extraordinary in here that really blew my mind and changed my life was um, actually I think it may have been in his other autobiography but he goes back to the slave plantation where his master was, the master's on the deathbed. Instead of killing and smoking the master, he's so venerable, if that's the right word. This man becomes so honorable and so noble, he forgives the master. I'm getting chills. He forgives the slave master and says, we were victims of our circumstance. You were you were a master because of this, the century that you were born in, because of the time that you were born in. I was a slave and I was in my condition because of the times that we were born in. And I forgive you for what you've done. So this man doesn't even have hatred in his heart. He's purified his heart. He details meeting in here, meeting with uh, Sojourner Truth, meeting with John Brown. It's priceless, priceless information. He details how John Brown's tables looked when he went in. John Brown is a European who had the uprising and um, and had a rebellion uh, to free slaves, and he was ultimately killed. But um, he, just, he details how frugal John Brown was and how he saved a lot of money and pinched pennies in order to save up to get enough for the uh, for the armory, enough a big enough arsenal to arm slaves and freedmen to to to. Um, Eventually, they went to get a stronghold in Appalachian Mountains. That didn't work out, but he just details how his walls look, how his table looked, how everything looked. That's priceless information. He describes the visage of John Brown, describes Sojourner Truth, how she was six feet tall, etc. It shows you that anything is possible, that a man who can go from talking like a, you know, like a play, he didn't have no information, no knowledge of self, no light, to ultimate brilliance he lets you know that anything is possible with the with the tools that we've been given anything is possible 
and it's not just a black history or slave, you know, slave history. This is dealing with any anybody who's come from obstacles, like me. My father sold cocaine. He didn't graduate from high school. My mother, she didn't graduate from high school. My father recently actually went to prison. I just posted, I posted a video um, uh, last, no, earlier this year in January, talking about um, how my father, you know, was was a fugitive and uh, purport, you know, he was a uh, purportedly he sold cocaine. I never saw him do it, so I don't know, but he's purportedly moved large large amounts of cocaine from South Central, and uh, he went to prison. So, you know, that's tough on that's tough on me. I'm I come from this background where most people wouldn't succeed. Most people would have broken, most people would have fallen off. And yet I'm here, thriving. I'm here in a Moorish manner. I'm here, you know, the library and the Buddha behind me, sitting, recording a video. So it shows that there are no limitations. My Bondage and My Freedom by Frederick Douglass. The book changed my life. He talks about, another thing he talks about is the resistances that he had. He talked about the psychology of slavery, how slavery is mostly mental, how he tried to free himself a bunch of times or a couple of times, and the times that he failed was because somebody snitched on him. Somebody sold out because they didn't, they couldn't conceive because their slave mind was so shackled, was so broken that they couldn't conceive how they could exist in a better state. They only believed that they could live in, the, in slavery, in servitude. And so they gave up the plot. He details how when he went to start his newspaper, his newsletter, the first, it, what, there weren't any successful Negro news um, papers and journals. And he had to create the North Star. He had resistances. People that were previously supporting him tore him down. When he first was going on his circuit and doing speeches, people didn't believe he was a slave because he was too eloquent. He talks about how dedicated he was and he used to read different books and dream about freedom. He realized that knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. There's so many beautiful things in this book. You gotta get this book. It's phenomenal. And I, and I need to finish his other autobiography actually because that details the end of his life when he was building uh, with the Freedmen's Bureau. I mean, he was the head of the um, the Freedmen's Bureau, and uh, you know that was a bank to a bank and an organization to get Negroes or you know Moors after post slavery back on their back on their feet um, with land with land grants, loans, etc. Um, he 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 did a lot of phenomenal work. He did a lot of phenomenal work. I mean, he describes. Um, traveling in Europe, he describes the different how the trains were back at the back in the day. He describes um, how he used to uh, how he, he worked in the Underground Railroad. Um, he was arming, uh, you know, brothers on the run. Um, he, he he talks about women suffrage, uh, you know, suffrage. He goes in. The main thing though, why this book changed my life is just detailing how noble he was, forgiving his master, how you can come from nothing and still achieve. And I mean, he went in dark times. He was almost sexually assaulted by his master. You know what I mean? He he, uh, he he was broke. He got sent away to get broken. I mean, he was working in Maryland the winter with just like a rag on and some shorts for 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 day for fourteen hours out the day in the snow. He was just getting broken, beat, mangled, and he still uh, survived. He still overcame, and you can too. And so can I. And so will I. And so must I, and so shall I. Your brother, your friend, your dietitian, back again for another installment in spirit, nutrition. Peace.